good evening uh, and welcome to the fourth day of the third session of the faculty development program on applications of artificial intelligence on geospatial data. So in today's session, we are privileged to have with us Professor Shashi Shekhar, and he has agreed to spare time from his busy schedule to be with us. Uh, thank you very much, sir. On behalf of the university and all the participants, we welcome you to this faculty development program. And uh, before we begin, sir, uh, I would like to give a very brief introduction uh, of Professor uh, Shashi Shekhar. He has received his BTEC degree in computer science from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, in 1985, the MS degree in business administration, and the PhD degree in computer science from the University of California, Berkeley, USA, in 1989. He is currently a McKnight Distinguished University Professor at the University of Minnesota, Minneapolis, USA. Professor Shashi Shekhar is internationally recognized for research, teaching, and professional service in spatial databases, an interdisciplinary area at the intersection of computer science and geographic information science. His research results are now playing a crucial role, a critical role, in evacuation route planning for homeland security and were recognized by the Center for Transportation Studies Partnership Award in 2006 for significant impact on transportation. Professor Shekhar was elected as an IEEE Fellow for contributions to spatial database storage methods, data mining, and GIS. He has co-authored over 180 research papers and a textbook on spatial databases by Prentice Hall, which has been translated into two foreign languages. He is currently co-editing an encyclopedia of GIS. I hope I have uh, stated, uh, I do not know whether there are updations or not. Uh, so this is what I found uh, uh, in the web page. So I'm, I think this is an old version, maybe. Uh, I'm not sure, sir, you'll be able to uh, tell us better. Uh, so uh, with this brief, very brief introduction, I would like to request Professor Shashi Shekhar to please start his deliberation. So okay, great. Th thank you so much for the warm introduction, Dr. Chakravarti. And so I'll share my screen. Okay, so are we able to see the PowerPoint slides? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Wonderful. So, um, so today you know, I'd like to share uh, some of my experiences in what is now being called spatial data science. And you know, uh, earlier topics included spatial databases. As you saw this book, uh, Dr. Chakravarti mentioned, 2003. Um, the Encyclopedia of GIS that was mentioned, I think first edition came out in 2008 and second edition in uh, 2017 and a few other publications also I'd like to share. So I was involved with the University Consortium on GIS and, um, and there you know, we issued a community call to include spatial topics in all data science degrees and curriculum. And most recently, uh, you know, we authored a book called Spatial Computing with MIT Press and that is for a broad audience. So, um, you know, as you know, with Uber, you know, ride sharing navigation, uh, billions of people are using this technology and many of them are curious. So this just came out last year, 2020. And I'll give a gist of, you know, some of these in the talk. So first, a very old story, and many of you may actually know this. And, uh, you know, if you have seen this before, uh, please go ahead and put it in the chat. Right? So 1854, uh, London cholera 
you know, this is the time some of the spatial data science story begins. At this time, the science wasn't very well developed. And in fact, the uh, standing hypothesis was that cholera was spread through bad air or bad odor, Maizama theory. Right? Uh, but during this epidemic, John Snow, the public health official, made this map. So if you have seen this map, you know, you can mention that in the chat. And uh, in this map, the little dots are where deaths happened. Um, so first thing John Snow noticed that the deaths were not all over London. They were concentrated in one area called Soho. And furthermore, they were concentrated around one water pump. These uh, squares are water pumps, the Broad Street water pump. Right? So he came up with a conjecture uh, saying that this water pump may have something to do with the cholera. But the science was not with him. So it took him several days to convince the city officials. But they decided to say, okay, let's do an experiment. Let's take the handle of this pump. And uh, that actually indeed started to subside cholera. And then, you know, a few years later, Louis Pasteur and others, they started pointing microscope at the water. And as we all know, you know, that bolstered the germ theory. And uh, today, you know, we all benefit from that, right? Doctors started washing hands, you know, drinking water supply, sewage line, all these were separated and so on. So this essentially tells you sort of the strength and weaknesses of spatial data science. Uh, we can generate conjectures and hypotheses, but we still need to follow uh, sanity checks, you know, in case of science, the control experiment and theory and so on to develop the actual knowledge. Right? So this, you know, of course, precedes the invention of computers, but you can ask, so what has changed in last 150 to 170 years? And this is one way to, to describe this, uh, this talk and we'll organize it around that, right? So first of all, we know the, the availability of data has increased. In fact, you know, we use the term big data and uh, data-driven hypothesis generation is also picking up and we sometimes call it as fourth paradigm in scientific parlance, right? Um, so, so things have evolved and what we are going to do is to look at at least five areas of how things have changed and what are some of the latest things that are going on, right? So first, let's look at the data. You know, when we look at uh, last century and this century, the data collection has become easier and because of that, we have more data, right? So already we know starting late 50s or 1960s, satellites were going up and uh, some of them started collecting data about the earth, right? And today that trend has accelerated. Now you have nanosatellites, you know, one Indian rocket has sent up more than hundred of these. And in addition, there are other devices like smartphones, right? So availability of spatial data has become uh, much better. And whereas, you know, John Snow took several weeks to make that map for a small area of London, right? So this is something, you know, just, uh, just to set the context. So, um, so here are some, you know, the reason some of these data collection has gotten easier. So first, the GPS receivers, you know, they are now ubiquitous. If you remember, it was only late 80s that GPS was opened for civilian use, right? But today, every smartphone has it. And actually, it goes well beyond smartphone. You know, there are 2 billion GP GPS receivers in use. It's used also as a clock, not just as a location. And in fact, most critical infrastructure, their clocks are synchronized to GPS. And it is so much so that some people worry that if GPS goes out, there will be a lot of disruption in the modern society. And because of that, people are developing backup systems, right? So Department of Transportation is testing about two dozen systems um, in order to, to protect the world from the vulnerability, right? Now these GPS, uh, you know, so this is one trend. In many cases, GPS devices, they leave a trail, right? So we know the trajectory. Here is another trend of nanosatellites. And because of that, you can collect data about the earth at much higher frequency uh, and so on. So here is a quick comparison. Many of you probably know, these are the old satellites. They look like a bus, you know, almost that size. And today the nanosatellites, they look like, we can say what a one foot by one foot by one foot. So more like a, a soccer ball, right, of that size. And because of that, the same rocket which used to carry one big satellite can now carry hundreds of these in launch, right? And India is also at the forefront of that. Uh, in 2017, I think one of the Indian rocket took almost 100 nanosatellites. And there are now companies like Planet Lab, which have hundreds of these nanosatellites. They can scan the earth every day. 
So each day they can give us a meter resolution scan in some set of, you know, small set of bands. Right? So this has increased the data availability as well. So, so this is sort of the, you know, impact of that. And, um, you know, the spatial data revolution, I can give a couple of examples. So one is these GPS and location traces. So as I mentioned, there are billions of GPS receivers. And uh, you know many of them, particularly the ones on smartphone and vehicles, their locations are being collected. Right? So, um, so this is a report from 2011, 2012, McKinsey Big Data Report. And it had chapters on many types of big data, okay? but one whole chapter on loca you know, location traces. And notice that even in 2012, McKinsey felt that these GPS location traces were very valuable, $600 billion annually by last year. Right? And some of that value is in some sense being used by uh, navigation services, ride sharing services in order to understand the traffic, predict the arrival, you know, estimated arrival time and things of that kind. Right? And there are many others, people are using it for advertisement and so on. Even during COVID-19, you know, some of this data finally was opened up to academics. So some of you may know SafeGraph, you know, COVID-19 consortium, and they made actually locations of personal, you know, these cell phones available to understand the spread of COVID-19. Even Google and Apple were, you know, uh, publishing these to say where people are going and things of that kind, right? So this is a very big data set, which has many, many use cases. Uh, one other example is the satellite uh, data set. And again, as I mentioned, you can get daily scans and a lot of that is now becoming open. And their value, you know, uh, estimated in 2019 is even more for energy exploration and so on, right? So today, geospatial data availability has grown, right? And that makes a big difference. And there are other types of data as well, which may people, you know, may or may not be familiar with. So most of the vehicles sold, you know, in this century, they actually have what is called onboard diagnostics data. So they measure hundreds of properties of the vehicle ranging for energy use, emissions, and those can also be collected and exploited to, to choose routes which reduce emission or energy use. So here is you know, one example. If you go to navigation services today, they give you routes to minimize travel time or distance. But using this data set very soon, you would be able to request routes which minimize energy use or emission. In fact, Google has already announced they will give you eco-routing by end of the year. Uh, the routes which reduce emission, right? Uh, we have had some projects in the area and we are showing you one project which shows you two routes. The blue route is given by Google map to reduce travel time. And the green route is computed using onboard diagnostic data by our you know, research software. And as you can imagine, the energy consumption is lower on the green route. And it's very simple intuition is you, many of you know the wind resistance is cubic in terms of speed. So sometimes it's better to take a route you know, which is slightly slower, but that can uh, reduce energy use and emission. So, so these, there are many other data sets of this kind which are coming up. So your GPS trajectory has many other attributes and, and a lot of opportunities are coming up, okay? So let me pause here for a quick minute and see if there are any questions related to the availability of spatial data. And with that, you know, big data trend, um, as I was mentioning, you you know, the, the data availability is growing a lot. And in India also, you recently saw a policy, right? Even the Indian government has opened up some of the data set collected by Indian satellites for domestic uh, use and so on. But that is happening in many, many countries. And I will show you more examples of what people are doing with it, right? So let me see if there are any questions on uh, data availability. Okay. All right, so it looks like uh, everyone is comfortable with that, but that's good. So this is one of the context. So, so let's next look at uh, data access, okay? These this geospatial data set usually tends to be very big, right? So even though the data is available, but trying to download it and process it itself can be challenging for many organizations because they are so big. So in 1990s, when we had a project to publish satellite data on the web, you know, precursor of Google Earth and so on, uh, UM and map server, 
we used to have to have a special antenna to go to NASA, you know, uh, DAX and, and download the data. But even this has changed in the last few years. And, um, and there are a lot of cloud repositories where the data is collected and you can just go and process them away, right? So just like GPS was made public uh, in late 80s, and it has now made a big difference in the society, there is a similar thing that has happening with remote sensing data. So about 12 years ago, USGS gave away Landsat satellite imagery. So we, people didn't have to pay for uh, using it, right? And that accelerated the trend with the President Obama's Open Data Initiative and similar things worldwide, many other data sets were made public, right? And today there are these cloud repositories. So for example, Google Earth Engine, uh, NASA Earth you know, Exchange, AWS Earth, and they have a large number of these uh, data sets which are available. Even India has started a small initiative in this area, and uh, for domestic use, they are making Indian data set available. So again, here, I'm not going to go through all of these data sets which are listed here, but let me pause and see in the audience, has anyone used any of these data sets? So things that you see here uh, in the chat, could people mention you know, if they have used any of this? Is anything familiar here? Yeah, participants, you may reply your answer at the chat box by writing okay. yes, no, whatever the interaction you want to make, you please put it in the chat box. Okay, so Dr. Saha is saying not familiar. So if anyone, if you are familiar with any data set, you can, all right, Landsat, so Mishta is mentioning she has used Landsat, good. Um, all right, Rashmi has used something like Landsat, wonderful. So Landsat has been around for a while and you know many people have used it. And there is a newer version from Europe from Sentinel satellite, which has slightly higher resolution. Okay, good. DG has used Sentinel. It's used in agriculture monitoring and so on. Um, okay, MODIS, SRTM, CHIRPS. Okay, wonderful. So you see many familiar data sets. And in past, you might have had to go and download them in this, from specific places. But today, as I mentioned, they're all on the cloud. So you can download parts of that and use it on your machine. Or if you don't want to do that, you can actually, these clouds also allow you to process the data at the cloud computer and simply get the results, right? So then, you know, the need for having high bandwidth um, communication link or, you know, large computers on your site has gone down. And there are many startups which are actually doing it. In fact, uh, one, also, you know, the interesting thing is that some of these data sets are coming with labels. So DARPA had a project about five years ago to try to identify all the buildings and roads and so on from satellite imagery. So they created some training data sets. Right? Um, so these kinds of machine learning kind of data set is also becoming available. But the key message is that, you know, you don't have to be limited by your local computing hardware in order to take advantage of some of the spatial data. Right. So that's a big change. And people are using it. One of the biggest, I would say, you know, societally most interesting use uh, besides weather prediction is global agricultural monitoring. And again, a quick question, have is any, are any of us familiar with GeoGlam, global agricultural monitoring? In the chat, you can again mention if you have come across this notion. Okay, Rashmi saying no, but has anyone come across GeoGlam? Okay, no. All right, so it's it's a new thing, you know, not highly publicized in academic world, but if you work for government or you work for any agricultural company, chances are that they are using it, okay? So this came in response to the Arab Spring. Many of us remember about 10 years ago in Arab world, there were a lot of chaos and many of us, you know, many of uh, the researchers trace it to the food prices and food availability, right? So after Arab Spring, uh, many countries, about 82 countries of the world came together who have, you know, uh, the satellites and they do a lot of, you know, they grow food in agriculture to put together this system. So what this system does is to issue a monthly report and they assess crop health for four major crops, wheat and rice may be more relevant to India, but maize and soybean are two other major crop worldwide. And they essentially look at the satellite imagery and from that you can, you know, assess things like NDVI and so on. So, but then they combine it with ground report. So, so the, there are 82 countries involved. They, they, you know, come up with some initial assessment. They do ground truth checking and every month they issue a report. And here is the color code. So if you see red or yellow, 
then they would be watching. The picture I'm showing here is an old one. Let me show you the latest report. This is from, you know, it's about a month old. And in this report, you are seeing that India is actually doing pretty well this year. But there are some areas you see Myanmar, you see, you know, part of Argentina or even south of USA. You know, USA, as you know, is going through a very severe drought, particularly in south and west. So, so those areas, people are worried about the crop. And what it does is um, you don't have to wait till the end of the season to know the yields were not sufficient, right? Now, based on the crop health, you can project end of the season yield. And this gives you an extra month or, you know, six weeks to take actions, whether that action may be to import food from other places or in case of places like India or China, which have a lot of you know, big food reserves, they may choose to take it out of food reserve and so on, right? So the hope is that you will not ever repeat the food shortage and the chaos that happened in Arab Spring. And this is a functioning system uh, for at least 10 years. And as I said, most agricultural you know, companies and government, they all use it, right? And this shows you a very um, Im impactful use of spatial data or satellite imagery, right? So now you can try to imagine what else is visible from space that you can monitor easily, which is needed for societal um, you know, um, concerns, right? So crops are one thing, but you could probably imagine, do you think surface water could be monitored through satellite? Could we see how much water is in the rivers or dams or reservoirs and so on? What's your guess? Yes, so Dr. Ghosh is saying yes. And, and so you can imagine that, you know, many places now they are looking at surface water and it is important for two reasons. You know, one is of course, to know the, the situation, but also, you know, you know, some countries, they don't like to share the water data, right? So any big rivers, which goes across the borders and if countries are not sharing the water data readily, then you can actually use satellite imagery to monitor you know, part of that and so on. You could all, you know, the water quality, you might want to uh, monitor that because some areas you get these, um, you know, algae growth and so on, which can affect drinking water quality and so on. So you can start to imagine what all, you know, you can monitor rainforest and lots of other things can be monitored and the data is available and GeoGlam actually shows where uh, even countries have come together and agreed to do it in a coordinated manner, right? So this is sort of showing you the use, okay? So again, let me, you know, I'll pause here to, um, to see if there are any questions, but the message so far is that, you know, we have more spatial data available. It has become easier to use, and it is now being used for some societally very important things like monitoring agriculture or monitoring rainforest, even some surface water and things of that kind. So it's, it's a very new world, you know, what, you may have imagined in last century versus what's happening in last 20 years is quite different, right? It's no longer a niche technology, only accessible if you know ESRI software, but it is becoming you know, widely available and widely used. Right? Okay, so I'll pause and see if there are any quick questions on the context before, you know, and before I mention the, the software and hardware platform, and then we will go to the main topic, spatial data science uh, for the day. Okay, so there's a question. Is any nanosatellite data available free of cost? Okay, so that's a very good question. Uh, the, you know, Planet Labs is probably has one of the bigger collection or fleet of nanosatellites. And they actually do make part of their data available to academics for research. So if you're interested in looking at nanosatellite data, I would reach out to Planet Labs and explore their academic program. Uh, I think the data that they give out is not the best resolution. You know, they may not give you the sub-meter resolution for free, but they will probably give you maybe four meter resolution uh, and maybe four bands. And yeah, of course, there is you know, a lot of interest in looking at the quality of nanosatellite data um, and whether with those limited bands, what can be done. But, but yes, Planet Lab does have academic agreements with many places and they are making data available. Right. Any other questions? Okay. All right. So let's then continue. 
So we, as I mentioned, lots of spatial data has become available. It has become easier to use. And now you may wonder that, you know, if I even if try to use it, what kind of software do I need to process the data? And, um, and then here, you know, I'll give a teaser, but many of you probably, if you have background in geospatial, it will not surprise you. But if you haven't used geospatial software and so on, then it is important to know that the generic software has limited support and you know it, it you know but you have better software available so let me start with the teaser and um and i'm going to actually first ask you you know about the generic software such as google search right so suppose i want to ask google what's the distance between new delhi and india or distance between washington dc and usa right so first, if I ask you this question, since most of you have some geospatial awareness, what will be your answer? You know, knowing that Washington DC, right, is a city inside the country of USA. If somebody asks you this question, how would you answer it? So you can type it in the chat. Okay, so while you type it, I will look at also another question that Sri Rupa Das has posed saying, are there any data set for surface water monitoring and urbanization monitoring in India having ground truth? Ah, that's a very good question. Ground truth is more expensive. So for ground truth, usually um, we, people go back to these published maps. So many countries, they have large mapping agencies and periodically they make the map and publish them, right? So for um, within India, I think Survey of India is one such agency. Um, and I know for urbanization, they probably, you know, there are maps every maybe 10 years or five years, probably even census data may have some information on that, right? For surface water monitoring in India, I am not sure if there is ground truth data available. So are there any hydrologists in this group who can share that? Does, you know, for example, in US, uh, you know, the USGS has sensors in many rivers and they measure the, the river flow, the water flow, and they publish that. And sometimes even for reservoirs, they might publish the level, right? So are there any hydrologists in the group who know if there are, you know, if within India, there are ground truth data on hydrology, like river level or reservoir level? Okay, Rashmi Singh is mentioning capital city. Okay. And WRIS, Dr. Ghosh is mentioning that. Okay. So this may be good to look at. Water community is also very organized and there are groups around, you know, um, within countries and across the world which try to collect the data. Okay. Great. And there is another question from Dr. Ghosh about, is there any good repository of UAV data, like open drone, open UAV? So I have not tracked the UAV data as much. So this one, again, I would not know, but if there are people in the audience who are looking at UAV data, please go ahead and share. The UAV data, the main thing to remember is that the coverage is very spotty. So usually if there is a flood or there is an e event, they go and monitor it, but UAV you know, takes more energy to cover a larger area. So those, those are harder. Okay, then also Dr. Um, Senthil is, is asking if there is any cost effective sensors to detect water level in agricultural land. Yes, this is another very interesting question. As you know, for agriculture, soil moisture is a very important attribute to predict uh, you know, crop health and, and the yield. And, um, and soil moisture, there are two ways to sense it, right? You can have an in-situation sensor, but those actually, again, you know, the cost adds up, right? If you have bigger area. But now there are also satellite-based measurement of soil moisture. And some of those data sets are becoming available as well. The resolution would be, you know, not as good as the one in situation, but yes, soil moisture sensing satellite, uh, you know, based data sets are coming up as well. And again, if people in the, you know, we have anyone from agriculture who knows a specific satellite about soil moisture, they're you know, welcome to put it in the chat. Okay. Okay. 
All right, so let's go back to this question. What do you think Google will answer if I try to type in this question in Google? And what, how would you like that answer to be? If I ask for distance between New Delhi and India or Calcutta and India to Google or Siri or Alexa, these general search engines, what answer do you think you, you want and what will you get? If you have access to Google, you can type it in and see what it says, right? All right. So first, if somebody asks you this question, how would you answer it? Ah, okay. So DG has actually typed it in and says, Google says 18 hours, you know, it's what, 1200 miles. And that's exactly right. But most of us who are geographically aware would probably say that Washington DC is inside USA. So the distance should be zero, right? But if you type it in the Google, you get these kind of answers. So, uh, so what gives here? I mean, why is Google giving this answer, whereas most of us would have expected zero, right? And this will tell you about a common uh, assumption or simplification in most software, okay? So most of the machine learning, data mining, text processing uh, software, they are very good at modeling points. So they model, you know, Washington DC as a point, which is center of Washington DC. They model United States as a point, which is the center of continental US somewhere in Kansas, right? And then they start computing distance, right? So they do not do good modeling of extended objects, right? Polygons and things of that kind. Right? And this is a blinder in most of the generic software. And this tells you why you should look at some spatial software, right? But uh, and, and slowly, you know, there is effort to improve Google and so on this open knowledge network. But right now, if you want to manipulate spatial data and you want to model geometries like line string, polygon and so on, then it's prudent to actually, um, you know, go to software which support it, right? And not all generic software does it. So what we are showing you is that almost 25 years ago, a, um, a standard was developed called Open uh, GIS simple feature standard. And it created a very nice, well-designed library with geometric types like points, line strings, and polygons. And along with these six types, they also added collections of polygons, collections of line string, collection of points. So if you take these six types, that has some very nice algebraic property called closure. So your result will can also be represented using these types. Now, in addition, they gave a set of functions, right? So you can compute things like distance. And this distance works not only between points, but also between polygons and many other geometric things, or even topological things, right? So these libraries have been available for 25 years, and there is no reason not to use them, right? The, you just need to know which software and where to get this library, right? So, um, and even if you are coming from machine learning, you know that average machine learning system, they always like to work in high dimensional space and they try to convert everything to a point. And when you do that, it's very hard to model a lot of these spatial relationships. And if you don't model these spatial relationships, uh, you actually are less likely to get an accurate model. So it's good to know this uh, representation. And you know, if you're using machine learning, you may want to materialize some relationships like distance. Uh, and make it, you know, them as the input of the machine learning. Okay, so so how can we actually, you know, access this kind of software? So this is available in many many places. So SQL was one of the earlier adopter, and if you look at things like this Oracle Spatial or Postgres, PostGIS, and so on, they all have this library. It's now also available in Python and Java and many other places, right? And you can use that for querying. So not only you know they have these data types. But systems like um, you know, Oracle and so on, they even have specialized data structures. So if you made these queries, they can run at reasonable efficiency. So, uh, so some of you might know this data structure called you know, um, R trees, right? And they actually are designed for faster searching of spatial data. And they are also widely supported now. So if you have Postgres and many other, you have spatial data structures like R trees, and you have these data types like points, lines, polygon with operations, so you can manipulate spatial data, right? And these are becoming widely available, not only on sequential platform, but if you are interested in a parallel platform also, these are becoming available and I'm listing some of these here. And you may wonder, well, in parallel platform, is there a need to think spatially? And there is because 
if you go to the generic Hadoop or cloud, they try to divide the data randomly, okay? Because they think random partition works pretty well. But in spatial data, you know, oftentimes it's better to divide it in spatially contiguous chunks. And if you do that, you get better performance, okay? So again, on cloud and other platform, you know, a lot of spatially aware softwares are coming up and uh, it's becoming easier to, to, to process big spatial data for simple queries, okay? okay. So this was again, you know, quit uh, saying that, okay, data is becoming available, you know, it's becoming accessible uh, and you have now a lot of software and hardware tools. So if you want to manipulate and do spatial analysis, your life is getting easier. So again, I will pause here and see if there are any quick questions. And also I wanted to know if people have used any of these kind of platforms. So you can type it in your chat, which platforms you may have used. And that will, that helps me understand the audience and customize some of the presentation to your background. So in the chat, could you please type in if you have used any of this like S SQL uh, in post GIS or Oracle or ESRI tools and things of that kind. Okay, so DG mentioned they have used post GIS, great. Anyone else? Okay. All right, but again, you know, be aware that these things are around just because, okay, SQL, okay, even HTML and PHP, they now have spatial support. So, um, so it's becoming QGIS is another good GIS tool. Wonderful. Okay. And ESRI GIS is also good. Okay. Okay, ArcGIS, QGIS, wonderful. So, so of course, ArcGIS and so on is probably one of the, the most um, richest set of you know, facilities available, but the basic facilities are now coming to even general purpose languages like Java, Python, SQL, and so on. But any other questions on this before we proceed to the, the main topic, which is spatial data science? Okay, okay, good. All right, so let's go to the next topic, spatial data science. And this is sort of the hard, but I did want to put a context uh, before going to the main topic, okay? So first question, you know, you may ask is, well, why can't we use traditional data science, right? Because we have uh, very rich statistical libraries, you know, like SAS and so on. And even classical data mining or machine learning, there are many methods which are being made available and they are very popular. So is there anything unique about spatial data that requires us to think, you know, carefully? Um, and, you know, it's the same thing that I said, Google search, when you ask simple questions, it starts to make assumptions which create problem for us, right? So are there similar things in machine learning in statistics as well, right? And so I will mention three things and you, some of you may know what you know, these. So one challenge is that our geographic data is embedded in a continuous space, okay? Whereas a lot of, you know, traditional statistics or machine learning often thinks in terms of discrete high dimensional spaces. Whereas we are in low dimensional space. For us, distance matters a lot. Uh, in high dimensional spaces, distances have less meaning, you know, okay? Another challenge is, um, you know, in spatial statistics, they have tried to formalize it, these challenge called autocorrelation, heterogeneity, and so on. And I will explain what these things mean. And these again violate assumptions in many popular statistical machine learning software where they assume IID, right? Data samples are drawn independently of each other or in, and from identical distribution. But these things are violated often by spatial data. And I will mention, you know, show what those are. And the third challenge, you know, is in terms of noise or um, cost of spurious patterns, right? Because often spatial use cases are societally important. So when we make mistakes, then, you know, the cost is very high. It's very different than, you know, trying to find cat videos. And, you know, if your prediction of about cat is wrong, I mean, there's not that much cost. But if your prediction about a hotspot of an epidemic is wrong, the cost is real, right? So, so we'll talk about these and then we'll motivate why some new techniques have been developed in this space that we should look at, right? Okay, so let's first start with this continuous space. Okay, so let me show you something very simple. 
and again, people who are from GIS can anticipate it very quickly, but people who are who are not from GIS may find this interesting. Okay? So suppose I have this spatial data with three red dots, two blue dots, and two yellow dots. Okay, and I want to know the interaction, spatial interaction between colors. So I want to know whether blue and red attract each other or repel each other. Right. Now, if you were not familiar with spatial statistics and you wanted to use classical statistics, one measure of these uh, interaction is correlation, like Pearson correlation coefficient, right? But in order to compute that, you remember this is based on vectors, right? So they would want us to divide this data. And this is one way to divide. If you divide it into four parts, this is one vector where red and blue are one, yellow is zero. Here again, red and blue are one, yellow is zero. But for this vector, yellow is one, but red and blue are zero and so on. So you get four vectors and you can compute Pearson correlation coefficient. And as you can guess with this partition, red and blue is one because the two vectors where one is present, other is present and the other two, neither is present, right? But if I do yellow and blue, the correlation is negative, right? So that's probably intuitive to you. Um, now, some of you probably know, you know, this notion called modifiable aerial unit problem, right? If I change the partitioning, if I change the partitioning, these numbers will change, okay? So what this is telling you is that some of the classical statistical uh, measures are sensitive to the way you partition the space, okay? But the original data was continuous. So question is, which one should we pick, the left one or the right one, or, or how, you know, or or is there a better way to deal with this situation, right? So again, let me ask the audience, number one, have you come across this problem before? And do you know how it is solved in spatial statistics and spatial analysis? And the, by the way, this problem applies to many, many traditional statistical methods. You know, you can go to linear regression, you know, lots of them, they will all suffer from that, you know, genies, uh, entropy measures, all kinds of traditional methods and machine learning, same thing would happen. You know. So has anyone seen this problem before? You know, have you come across MOP and do you know how it is addressed in spatial methods? Or at least tell me, did it surprise you? You know, see, because a lot of times spatial data comes partitioned, people may use zip codes or, you know, census blocks or districts or states, and then they start analyzing it, and they may or may not realize that, that their results are sensitive to the way data was partitioned. Okay. Did it surprise you? Was there, or did, just like the Google example I was asking, is it a surprise or you think this made sense? All right, so again, if you are from GIS, then this is very well known. There is a hundred year old literature on MOP, but people outside GIS are often surprised. If you're coming from classical statistics or classical data mining, sometimes people have not thought about it, right? So, um, the, so people who know this, how many of us know modifiable aerial unit problem? Could you type it in chat if you have come across this before? Okay. All right, it's pretty quiet. Let me actually do a quick polling just so that I get a feeling. Um, so I have launched a poll and you can just, you know, choose A if you know, if you know modifiable aerial unit problem and click on B if you don't, right? Let's just do that quickly. So A means I, I was, I'm, I'm familiar with modifiable aerial unit problem. B means I am not familiar. Okay. Okay, we'll wait ten more seconds.
All right, I'm going to end the poll and publish the result. Okay, so in this case, you know, uh, as you notice about two dozen people have answered and looks like majority did not come across this. Okay. So this is one, you know, simple thing to remember, you know, that uh, or learn and people who are aware, you know, familiar with modified aerial unit problem, they would know that, you know, this is one reason why we have spatial methods. And one of the key ideas, which I will introduce shortly, is to try to avoid partitioning the space. And if we have the base data, then there are other techniques which can create a neighbor graph and, and we'll show you how we are, we are going to use it. In some cases, we don't have control. For example, in census data, you know, we don't have we don't have often access to the base data, and all you get is a partitioning. And in that case, if you are doing the analysis, you should at least acknowledge the sensitivity of the result to the partitioning, right? But if you can access the base data by you know going through the census protocols and go to base data, your analysis will be more accurate. Okay, but nonetheless, it, this is something to remember. Spatial data has these kind of challenges. All right. So let's go and try to uh, see you know, how it impacts data mining as well. So, so again, a quick thing here, how many of us know association rules here? I'm going to relaunch the poll. And again, A say, I know association rules in classical data mining. B means I don't know association rule in classical data mining. Dear participants, you need to just uh, submit your answer with A and B, whatever the thing is playing in your screen, that is pool. So you have to respond it with A and B as Surya has instructed. Yeah. All right, we'll wait uh, five more seconds. And Okay, I'm going to end the poll and publish the result. So, so about you know 30 people answered and about a third know about association rule. And if you're not familiar with association rule, don't worry about it. Uh, but the main thing I know that the message I'm going to share is that even classical data mining methods face the same problem. So here I'm showing you again, you know, green, blue, and red things. And the question is, you know, which ones have spatial affinity? If I divide the data this way and run association rule mining, you can imagine this pair will come out in the result. But if I divide it in a different way, the result changes. If I divide it in this way, the result changes, right? So this problem is not unique to machine learning and uh, statistics, but even spatial, you know, even a lot of classical data mining methods suffer from the same instability. And um, so again, you know, if people are doing this partitioning, they should acknowledge the sensitivity to it, which is often not done in data mining literature, right? All right, so let's now think about the solution. Okay, how, how do spatial statistics and spatial data mining people get around this problem? So what they do is they try to not divide the space, okay? So if this is your base data, they define what is called a neighbor graph. So, so don't do partitioning and instead define a neighbor graph, and you can ask how, how is neighbor defined? So simplest way to define the neighbor is by distance, but there are other ways to define neighbor as well, right? So in this case, you know, if I put a distance threshold, then, you know, you can say if the distance threshold is greater than this, these two are neighbors, this is neighbor, and so on. These two are not neighbors and so on. So you create a neighbor graph, and then we define our statistics on the neighbor graph. So in classical spatial statistics, there is a measure called Ripley's cross K, right? Which is defined on this neighbor graph, right? And you can roughly think of it as the number of edges present divided by number of possible edges, okay? And in, uh, you know, spatial data mining literature, there's another measure called participation index, which I will shortly define, right? Which is also defined on this particular graph, right? So because we never partitioned it, this these measures are not sensitive to partitioning, of course, they are sensitive to the distance threshold that was used to define neighbor graph. So these are often defined as a function of distance and I will define both of them, okay? So this is one core idea in spatial statistics or spatial data mining 
is to work with the neighbor graph. Okay? Uh, if you want to view it as a matrix, so this is called the adjacency matrix, which you know where each row and column is a data point, and the entry and the matrix is a boolean, you know zero or one, saying whether they are neighbor or not. Right. So this is one key idea to remember. We go to neighbor graph and not partition data. Okay. And this comes from point process theory, as some of you may know. So let's look at replace cross K function in a little bit formal detail. Okay. So suppose I have two features i and j, like red and blue, right? Then this replace cross K function is a function of distance. This h is the distance threshold that we chose. Okay. And how you know how is it defined? So what you do is you pick, let's say, one red event and you count how many blue events are within distance h of that red, right? And you do that for every red event and take the average, right? This is the expected value, right? So that's your base number. And of course, we are going to also normalize it by global density, how many red points are there overall, right? So that's how it is defined. And I'm going to give you an intuition by a small example, okay? And as I said, this cross -K function can be used to decide if a pair attracts or repels and so on, right? And this also comes with the statistical significance, if you're interested in that. And there is literature, some of you may have seen this book by Cressy or other book on spatial statistics, but let's understand it intuitively. So let me give you a cartoon map. Um, so here is a cartoon map. And just to give you intuitive understanding of what replace cross K is doing, okay? So this cartoon map, you see there is house and there are many instances of house, there is bluebird, many places bluebird nests are there, green trees right um, you know eagle dry tree fire and so on so intuitively let me ask you in this map can you spot a pair such that whenever i see instance of one i see instance of the other nearby okay and you can put your answer in the chat okay so stare at the map and tell me that do you see some feature types which attract which means whenever you see one you see instance of the other one nearby Okay, so put it in the chat. Okay, bird and house, we got one answer, and that looks like the case. So here is house, you see bird, house, you see bluebird, house, you see bluebird. I mean, not possibly always, this house may not have one nearby. Certainly this one doesn't, but quite often, right? And then we, another one, people are saying bird and tree. Um, okay, so bird and tree, you notice sometimes it's green, sometimes it's you know, but a more stronger one you will see is dry tree and fire, okay? So anyway, now you get intuition of what we are talking about and replace cross K can tease it out. So for this data set, if I plotted replace cross K as function of H, then you notice that the bird and house, you know, that blue line is over here and dry tree and fire also red line is here, okay? Now, so these are the actual values replace cross K, but the, uh, in order to get statistical confidence, you can ask what's the expected value if these two points did not have anything to do with each other. They were complete spatial random. And that value is shown over here and it grows as the area of the circle pi h square. And if you run you know, this cross K in a proper statistical software, you will also get a statistical confidence band using Ponte Carlo simulation. It can tell you that if I put complete spatial random, then what's the range of spirit please cross K that's expected. And over, you know, and you will see that these two pairs, they are well outside that range. So they are attracting each other and it's statistically significant, okay? So that's one way to think about it. Now, uh, the only, you know, going from pairs to triples and so on is difficult for replace cross K and it gets computationally expensive. So uh, our group about 20 years ago, we defined another measure and a notion of spatial co-location pattern and uh, these measures are called participation index. And the goal was to not only have statistical interpretation, but also have computational property, very much like you know, the association rule exploits the a priori kind of um, you know, property, non-monotonically decreasing, and this has a similar property. So this is a trade-off between computation and statistics. 
And the way it is defined is a conditional probability, right? So it's defined for any subset of the features that you have. And first we define participation ratio. So for example, suppose you're looking at individual features and its participation in a subset, then it basically tells us the conditional probability that whenever I see the red feature, I have the whole pattern in the neighborhood, right? So here, if I'm looking at this pair, there are three red features, two of them have, uh, actually two of them have blue nearby, right? So that's two by three. And you can also flip it. So for blue, there are two blues and only one has red nearby, so it's half and participation index is the minimum of the two, right? So in this case, it's a half and so on. So this one, as I said, has more computational property and very much like you know, a priori algorithm, there are algorithms to go through these exponential subsets and find out the ones which have participation index above a certain threshold, right? Um, so they are very similar ideas, just depending on um, the computational thing. And we are showing you another example here, three data sets and the value of cross K and participation index. Um, so for, let's check, you know, just one of them. So in this case, you notice that, you know, there are three blue and two of them have red nearby. And whereas there are two red and both of them have, so minimum of two thirds and one is two thirds and so on, right? So that's how they are computed. So this is just showing you the statistical property of the participation index being an upper bound on cross K, normalized cross K. Okay. And there are algorithms and you know they're different. Um, so these ex algorithms are a little more expensive than a priori algorithm for association rule because you have to compute spatial joins. Right? And there are different algorithms and uh, people have extended it with statistical significance as well and extended it to spatio-temporal situation as well. So I'm going to just show you one spatio-temporal and then see if there are any questions, okay. So in space and time also, you can talk about things that are close together. So here is one example, you know, in many uh, urban areas, um, bars close, you know, late night. And oftentimes what happens is that, um, as you know, alcohol is a source of um, bad behavior. So once the bars close nearby, people may see, you know, some kinds of other activities. So in this case, we are showing assaults or drunk driving. But uh, so little later, you see these and little later in little further away, you, we see these and so on. So these can also be captured using a patterns like this. So in spatio-temporally, whenever this kind of event happens, little later in the spatial neighborhood, we may see this kind of event or that kind of event, right? So the same notion being extended. All right, so again, but the key idea here was to say that, you know, if we use neighbor graph, then it, uh, gives you a more robust method to measure spatial attraction or repulsion um, and, and interpret them in a more robust manner, right? And, and there are many different methods which do that, like Ripley's cross K or um, co-location participation index and so on, okay? All right. So I'm going to pause here and see if there are any quick questions on the neighbor graph or Ripley's cross K or co-location here but it kind of told you about one challenge that classical data mining or statistics faces for spatial data and the general idea of how to overcome that challenge by using neighbor graph. Has, okay, let me also ask, has anyone used the Ripley's cross K or these spatial statistical methods which use neighbor graph? You can type it in the chat. I believe even ESRI uh, ARC has a spatial statistical or geostatistical package, which probably implements these methods. So in the audience, if anyone has used it, please put it, it in the chat. Of course, R has a library as well on Ripley's cross K. So, so many of these are accessible and you can try that. Okay. Or did you see this covered by Professor Gopal or other topics in the, already? Uh, no, sir, it was not covered. Okay, okay, all right. Okay, good. So let's then continue. We talked about one issue. Let's go to another challenge, you know. This is a challenge of autocorrelation and so on. And very likely autocorrelation, I would hope was, was covered, but let's at least look at what this idea is 
And now we are going to formalize the notions from spatial statistical uh, language, right? Um, and then we'll go to this, uh, the cost of positive, okay? So now this is more formal. So mathematically inclined folks may like this discussion more, but many of us know this IID assumption, but let me again have a poll. So we, we I will relaunch it. Um, and I want to know whether we know the meaning of IID. So, in, so if you know the meaning, click A. If you don't know the meaning, click B, okay? And I will talk through it while you click. So if you have for, looked at formal descriptions of many statistical methods like linear regression or even Pearson correlation coefficient, you will often come across this assumption. And what it basically says is that data samples are drawn independently of each other. They are mutually independent, that's first I and they are drawn from identical distribution, right? And using this assumption, you can simplify lots of things in statistics, uh, particularly for hand computation, you know? Um, and so, so let's spend five more minutes to see, to complete this poll and I will share that and I will discuss where it came from and what's its ramification, okay. All right, so five more seconds. All right, I'm going to end the poll and share the result. And looks like about, again, two dozen people filled out and only about a fourth are aware of IID and others are not, that's fine. But let's you know talk about it. If you are more as a mathematical, statistically inclined, then this is a language that will help you, okay? So this assumption was made a um, long time ago because you know statistics is much older than computer science, right? It goes maybe 400 years back. Um, and back then you can imagine, you know, when if you wanted to do linear regression or Pearson correlation coefficient, you had to compute by hand, right? Um, so what people had to use measures which were easier to compute by hand. And this assumption kind of was made in that context. It's, it, it doesn't have a whole lot to do with reality, but it makes your calculation easier, okay? Uh, and if you can do this, then you can hand compute Pearson correlation coefficient. In fact, some of you might know that, um, you know, 18th century around that 1857 rebellion, you know, Britishers were collecting data all over the world and they wanted to compute Pearson correlation coefficient. So guess what their computer was in 1800s. And by the way, those correlations were pretty powerful. They, they saw the correlation between El Nino, which is warming of Pacific, and the change in weather in Australia or India, you know, and things like that, by using this correlation coefficient. But how did they calculate that when, you know, does anyone know that story? Right? So they had basically hired a bunch of people in India, you know, places like Madras, and they were hand calculating these things for the Britishers, right? So, so anyway, these assumptions were made for a simplification of mathematics and calculation, okay? And uh, they are okay in many domains, but for spatial domain, they are very problematic. And that's what I'm going to go talk about next. And uh, when we talk about autocorrelation, it violates the first I and heterogeneity violates the second I. So let me actually show you visually what it means and, and why it's problematic, right? So here I'm showing you two maps. The top map, each pixel property, you know, blue being low and red being high, is being picked independently of the properties of nearby pixel. And this is what the map looks like. This is IID data. Bottom, I'm showing you a real map. Um, and let me actually again put a poll to see, um, okay, how many of us have seen the map like the top one? Okay, sorry. Okay, let's fill it this. The top map, have you seen maps like the top one? Okay, so if you have seen, say, you know, type A, if you have not seen, you know, and seen more of the, the bottom one, then click on B, okay. So real maps, what do you think? Do they look like the top map or the bottom map? That's the question. So if, if you think real map looks like top map, click A. If you think real map looks like the bottom map, click B, you know. So, okay, five more seconds. 
All right, I'm going to close the poll and publish the answer. And here it looks like again, uh, more people actually voted for A and then B. And so that is not what I was expecting, <laughs> okay. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, most maps that we see, they look like the bottom map where nearby things are similar. And I will tell you that, you know, even the first law of geography says nearby things are similar, okay. The top map is more like white noise, okay. This is very rare in nature, okay. You might see it occasionally, but, or at a very certain scale, but human scale, the top maps are very rare, okay. Bottom map is, is more likely where nearby things are similar. Remember, even your calculus tells you that the most things are continuous and differentiable. Discontinuities are rare, right? And this is full of discontinuities. So, so in special statistics, you know, this smoothness or nearby things being similar has been formalized as autocorrelation. And, um, you know, and as I said, in quantitatively in geography, this is the first law of geography, which says nearby things are similar. Basically, all things are connect, you know, are connected to all other things, but nearby things are more similar than distant things. So this is more likely to you are going to see in geography data. This will be very rare. If um, and this is what IID assumption. You know, if you see maps like this, you should be happy using classical statistics. But if you see maps like this, then you should look at spatial method because it's violating the assumption, okay? So let me actually show you one case study of how, you know, what difference does it make? So this was a thesis in Minnesota about nest location of a particular bird. The red crosses are the nesting site. And, you know, and then these are explanatory variable like vegetation index. These are real maps, you know, people went to wetland and mapped, you know, five meter by five meter pixel. There are 5,000 pixel here. This is water depth. This is distance to open water. And you notice that all of these, you know, they look more like the second map where nearby things are similar, you have spatial smoothness. And the goal here is to build a, a prediction model to figure out where would this bird nest given these explanatory variables, okay? You can view this data also in a tabular form and um, where, you know, you would have 5,000 pixels with four columns. So one column would be the nest location, yes, no. Other three columns would have numbers for water depth, distance to open water and vegetation index, right? So given this, we can ask about, you know, what kind of prediction model you might use to predict nestworthy location from explanatory variable. And again, let me, you know, pause for a minute and see what would come to mind if I want to build a prediction model for nestworthy location out of explanatory things. So in the chat, you can type in, you know, any uh, prediction model or classification model that you might think would help here. So, so given these explanatory variables, I want to, you know, use machine learning or statistics to predict whether that location is likely to have a nest or not. What kind of models will come to mind? Okay, linear regression, one person says, yeah, that's the most popular model. Um, SVM was very popular in machine learning and so on, right? So let's look at some of them. But you know, the key thing to realize is that linear regression does have IID um, uh, assumption. SVM, it's not as explicit, but you know, many other machine learning model also have IID assumption, right? So let's look at linear regression. And that's one way to understand how autocorrelation matters. So this is your linear regression equation. Net, the Y may be the nest, you know, probability of nest at a location, and X may be these explanatory variables at that location. And this model will learn beta to figure out how much to weigh each explanatory variable, right? So this is linear regression. Now, uh, so this one assumes IAD. And the question is, what happens if you still use it? You can use it, but you know your prediction accuracy won't be as good and the residual errors will show spatial autocorrelation, okay? Here is the model from spatial statistics. And notice what it has done is to add a new term. So let's try to understand what this model is saying. Rho is a scalar, and this is the degree of spatial autocorrelation. So it has a value between minus one and one, and it's estimated from the data. W is a matrix representation of neighbor graph. So for 5,000 pixel, the matrix is 5,000 by 5,000, and the entries in the matrix, right? So each row and column represents a location, and the matrix entry tells you whether that location is neighbor of that other location or not, right? And it's row normalized. So when I read this model, it's basically saying that the probability of nest at a location is only partially explained by explanatory variable at that location, but it is partially explained by nests in the neighborhood, okay? So that's what this model says. 
And you can imagine in real life also this happens. If you think about where people build houses, right? Uh, in Calcutta is a great example of that uh, as well. Uh, and But I will let me talk about New Orleans, right? When um, If any of you remember Hurricane Katrina and the flooding map, you will realize that the oldest neighborhood, French quarters, was not flooded, whereas the newer place like downtown was flooded. And it's a similar situation in Calcutta. When people first come, they build on the best land, right, which is high, which is protected. You know, it's not likely to flood. But then more people come, and now they are building in the vicinity. You know, even though the land is not great, but it's close to jobs, right? It's close to other facilities, so they build there. And then in when you have extreme events, then it has adverse effect, right? So same thing, you know, birds are also social. So some come and build it because other birds are in the neighborhood, not because that's the best place, right? So, so that's this model. Now also notice this model is a strict generalization of linear regression. So you're estimating rho from the data. And if your data indeed satisfies IID assumption, rho will come out to be zero. So you have no, nothing to lose here, just a little bit of computation. Okay, Divya, raise the hand. Do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Okay. Divya, do you want to ask a question? Open your microphone or put it in the question answer. Okay. Yes, yes go ahead, please. Ma'am, you may raise your hand. We have unmuted you. You can ask your question directly. Okay. Please also type it in in QA because that seems easier to follow. Yeah. But if you have microphone access, please ask your question. Oh, okay. So D, they are asking how will we calculate? Oh, very good. I mean, that's the leading question. And I'm going there next. Okay. All right. So, so, okay. Anyway, first we understand the model. And the number one thing, you know, this model is supported in MATLAB, in R, and many places. So, you don't have to figure out the algorithmic detail if you just want to use it. And so, those software will estimate it for you. But if you are interested in the computational aspect, you may have wondered why computer scientists are in this space. Then, this is what you have to realize. Okay. For least, for the linear regression, remember, you know, if I ask you, how do you estimate beta? then your answer will be least squares, right? Because least square estimate actually turns out to be also maximum likelihood estimator for classical uh, linear regression. But that's not the case for spatial autoregression. And here you have to actually bite the bullet and minimize the, this uh, likelihood function, which looks like this, okay? So it has this sum of square error, which is similar to what you get in least squares. It has some constants. But here is a computationally intensive uh, term, which is a determinant of I minus rho W. Remember, W was quadratic in number of points. So this is a big matrix and it is expensive, right? But there are algorithms. So you can either do approximation like Taylor series or Chebyshev series expansion, or you can just do golden section search. And these algorithms are also available. But the main point to know is that this is computationally a little more expensive than linear regression. And this tells you one of the reasons why these models did not pick up till recently. Okay, so so these models, you know, they need, you know, there is extra parameter, so you need more learning samples, but you also need more computation. So in last century, this was a little bit harder. Computers were not powerful enough to scale up to big data set, but that limitation is going away. In this century, your computers are powerful enough, you have enough data, and you can play with it. So I hope that answers the question. Uh, Divya, are you comfortable with this? You know, okay, good, good. And if you are if you are interested in more details, you know, here is one of our papers. You can look at uh, different uh, details of this as well. Okay, good. All right. So this brings up, you know, why computer scientists should also be involved here, and it's a good interdisciplinary area, right? Now you may want to say, okay, you know, what that extra computation does it pay off? And so in this thesis, we are actually showing you the ROC curve for linear regression and spatial autoregression. And you see about 10 to 15% better prediction accuracy, both in learning and testing, right? So in many cases, it does pay off. Even in weather prediction, people do model spatial autocorrelation because as you can imagine, weather at nearby place at nearby time are similar, okay? 
All right. There are other ways. If you are very concerned about the cost of maximum likelihood estimator, then you can take some shortcuts. Of course, there will be some loss, right? So machine learning people, they often take this shortcut. So they don't want to go to maximum likelihood estimator. They want to stick to least squares. They love least squares, right? But in least squares, what you can do is to put a regularizer, okay? So your error function is that, you know, the, the error of prediction, plus you penalize the case when your prediction is very different from your neighbor, okay? So this is a regularizer way. And with this, the machine learning folks will go back to least squares, which is very fast and which is fine. But you have to realize that when you do that, you, you may get prediction accuracy, you may get computational speed, but your solution will be biased, okay? Whereas if you are willing to pay computational cost and do this maximum likelihood function, then you will reduce the bias. So there are different ways to do that. It's your choice how you want to play the computation and the statistical rigor trade-off, and there are different ways to do it. Okay. okay. All right. Um, of course, you know there are other you know open problems here, you know um, which you know we can briefly mention. You know one of the problem is that. Um, you know, your error function still does not capture all the spatial aspects. So if you want, you know, we can have a quick poll here again, just to bring out that point. So suppose, you know, this is a map, these are three actual nests. So in a discretized map, you know, we, we say actual nests are at these pixels, these three pixels. Suppose you have two prediction model, one is C, and that predicts the nests over here, and D that predicts the nest over here. So let me again do a quick poll to see your preference between model C and model D. Uh, and so this case, what I will say is maybe click on C or D, okay? So if you prefer model C, click on C. If you prefer model D, click on D. And, and let's try to see what the preference is. So just only choose C or D. And you know, B shows you the ground truth, C shows you one prediction, D shows you not. So just click on C or D. And let's spend another, okay. Another five seconds on this. All right, so I'm going to close the poll and publish the result. So this case looks like, you know, 16 people preferred C and some preferred D, okay. So people who prefer D, could you tell me why did you prefer D? People who prefer D, was there any spatial aspect here that attracted you? Can you put it in the chat? Okay. Close to ground truth, yes, prediction is closure. So you look at the distance between prediction and actual, it's closure. So people who are spatially inclined might prefer this, okay? But nonetheless, let me actually ask you, if you know statistics of machine learning and total square error, what's the ranking between, what's the ranking of C and D in terms of total square error? If I'm counting, you know, precision recall or, or error, um, how would that be ranked if you were following true statistics here? I mean, you know, especially people like D because the distance between prediction and actual is shorter, right? Some people like C, but let me ask you, what does the statistics like or machine learning like? How many errors are in C? Notice six errors, right? These are all false positive and we missed the, these negatives, six errors. Here also six errors, right? So you notice that in case of statistics, these two are equal and they, they, you know, they don't care. But spatially informed people would want to see the distance part. And these are the kinds of things which are still not modeled because people still assume the residual errors are IID. So there are other things which need to be modeled, but you know, at least uh, your motto correlation is being modeled. Okay. So with this, I'm going to you know, proceed in interest of time. I know it's pretty late in India. This spatial autocorrelation can be embedded in other models as well. So here we are showing you a decision tree model. Um, and for wetland classification with aerial imagery. So, you know, wetlands, as you know, again, Calcutta also has a lot of wetlands. So, you know, they are very important for cleaning the water as well as for climate change and so on. So there is a lot of effort there to map the wetlands around the world. And it's pretty expensive to do it manually. So people will want some algorithmic techniques like uh, in this. So decision trees were popular, you know, late last century. Now some people are trying new methods as well. 
But methods like decision tree also have IID issue and it manifests in this salt and pepper noise. You see these little green pixels surrounded by red and same thing inside the green area you have the red pixel surrounded by green, right? So those are called salt and pepper and that again violates spatial autocorrelation. So people have to do post-processing to smoothen it, right? But you could embed it in the decision tree learning. So this is called spatial decision tree and you will see your prediction itself will reduce salt and pepper noise, okay? Um, so again, autocorrelation is a notion that you can embed in different learning methods. We showed you how to embed it in linear regression. You can embed it in um, decision tree. And the idea is that, you know, old decision tree was only looking, looking at local features for a pixel. But what you could do is to look at also the, the autocorrelation. So in the new spatial decision tree, you look at local features, but you also look at the comparison with the neighborhood. So this is your local autocorrelation, okay? And so on, all right. So, so this is sort of the summary slide. As I said, regression, if you add autocorrelation, it becomes spatial autoregression. Decision tree, you know, you can also do that. Um, you know, in Bayesian classifier also, you can put in the neighborhood information. In neural networks, this has been also done. And many of you know convolutional neural networks, which has been very successful in computer vision. But its core idea is the same. To classify a pixel, you look at nearby pixel as well. Don't just look at the local things, right? Um, so this is sort of, you know, the one key idea is called autocorrelation. And that can be embedded to improve the prediction and, and the residual errors, okay? Good. Um, so let me mention the one other issue. We talked a lot about autocorrelation, but to introduce heterogeneity, I just want to quickly have one more poll. So as you know, CNN is used for uh, classifying computer vision imagery as well as remote sensing imagery. So a quick poll here, um, I'm asking you to recognize snow and they are, there are three choices, okay? There are three choices. So which of these pictures do you think is snow? You know, you can click. Um, a, B, or C. Okay, don't pick D. Okay, so pick A, B, or C if you think that is snow. And only one of them is actually snow. Okay, let's spend five more seconds. Okay, I'm going to close the poll and publish the result. Okay, and you notice people are split, right? They, it was, they were choosing any of them, so it's all over the place. Um, and let me now show you the reality. So the first one is actually from Gujarat. This is the, you know, you can salt marsh. This is another, this is white sands, again, not slow. And this is snow. So you saw even we have difficulty sometimes, you know, identifying things. So you can imagine that even if you run CNN, it will have difficulty. However, if you told the location, if with A, I told you this is Gujarat, right? Then would any of you have picked it as snow? Probably not, right? Gujarat, we seldom see snow, right? So you would have said, oh, it can't be snow, right? and so on. So given, so this is an example of spatial heterogeneity and knowing the location can help neural networks or, or any, any uh, classifier. And this is what I was basically telling that convolutional neural network are very successful, very popular, but all the model is autocorrelation. They do not model heterogeneity and some of the other issues. So there is room to improve them. And I just wanted to mention, you know, uh, for heterogeneity where your model varies across location, there are other methods. One of which is, you know, for regression, it's called geographic weighted regression. And some of you may have seen that. So here your model form is not changed. You are still saying y equal to x beta plus epsilon. But what you do is that these coefficients, individual beta is a map. It's no longer a scalar. So here you notice beta naught is a map. Beta one is a map. Beta two is a map. And basically, even though your, your general form is the same, but the actual coefficients in the model are changing from place to place, okay? And you can do the same thing with neural network. Neural network is these edge weights usually are scalar, but if you allow them to be a map, then you get spatially, spatial variability aware neural networks and they can you know, do better if your geographic extent is large, right? So just giving you another challenge. 
But with this, let me maybe pause here and see if there are any questions about autocorrelation and heterogeneity. Again, you know, I would say one of the top messages in this entire talk is the notion of spatial autocorrelation. Uh, geographers think of it as first law of geography. So it's certainly something important to remember and say that, you know, um, that when you're analyzing spatial data, then not only continuity matters, but also spatial autocorrelation. So I'll pause here and see if there are any quick questions on what is spatial autocorrelation and how it impacts the choice of models. Okay. I know it's getting late, so I'll try to wrap up, but see if there are any quick questions here. Okay, so I don't see any questions in the chat or QA. So let's go look at the third challenge then, okay? What happens if you have noise and so on? Uh, so basically in a lot of spatial applications, you know, there are, there are societal implications. So, okay, all right, so let's go back. So one question is please elaborate spatial autocorrelation in CNN. Okay, good, good question. Dr. Kush, right. you can you can even unmute and ask because you're in the panelist. Okay. All right, Dr. Ghosh, you want to elaborate on the question or you want me to maybe go ahead? And talk about yeah, you can elaborate it. Say if we uh, use satellite image for uh, this thing, classification of satellite image uh, using say CNN, yeah. how how can we uh, use this uh, correlation aspect? Okay, so so CNN already models autocorrelation, you know. So if you remember the notion of convolution, right? Convolution, what they are doing is so to say, well, for when I look at an individual pixel, I look at nearby pixel, right? That I convolve with a frame. So it could be three by three or five by five neighborhood, right? So you remember the architecture, the very first layer of CNN. Uh, what it does is to have a neighborhood for each uh, pixel, right? Of course, the weight that you give to each neighbor, CNN tries to learn that. Whereas in many spatial methods like spatial autoregression, user specifies that. So user can say, you know, the weights of each neighbor is, is one eighth or one, you know, or one fourth or something, right? And, but CNN, learns the weight itself, it learns the convolution. So convolution and spatial autocorrelation are very similar ideas, right? Just like wavelets, again, wavelet, remember what it is doing. It's looking at the neighborhood, right? All the nearby things are processed together, right? So the wavelet is also a very similar idea as spatial autocorrelation. If you think about Markov random fields, very similar idea because you connect the neighbors, right? And say that they are, they are linked and their behavior should be somewhat similar. To classify a location, I do give some weight to what's happening in the neighborhood. So does, does that matter? Or do you want to maybe rephrase the question? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, so one aspect is that if we do variography, then the, uh, the range will guide us to select the size of the image chip, isn't so? Right, right, hmm. yes. Okay. And if we say want to use uh, this uh, satellite image regression or classification, say mm -hmm. using random forest model or artificial neural network mm -hmm. uh, in Python, then uh, what should we do? How, how to okay. handle it? Okay, so that's a very good thing. So you mentioned you brought up variograms, right? Variograms can help us know the, the size of the neighborhood, right? Is that is that fair? Yeah. Okay. So, so CNN folks have, you know, as far as I know, I have not seen them kind of link the variogram part. So they take a guess at the size of the neighborhood, but then they have a hierarchical organization to have some flexibility, very much like wavelet. Okay. But if you know variogram, then you can guide the CNN architecture, right? So suppose you plotted the variogram and you know that in your image at the given resolution and your phenomena, Let's suppose variogram tells you that neighborhood extends about seven pixels or 11 pixels, right? Yeah. If you know that, then you can actually use that information in designing the input layer of CNN. 
So the neighborhood that CNN is using, you could base that on the finding of the variogram, and that will, you know, very likely give you better results than a typical one. Because you know, a lot of uh, neural networks they will just go seven by seven, and you know, and whereas if you knew the variogram actually says that it's eleven pixel, then you may be better off using eleven by eleven, so on, right? So you can bring that information to CNN. I hopefully does that address the question. If I want to use this satellite image for say, random forest classification, then yeah. in Python, how how can I do it? Okay, so random forest, uh, you know, the easiest thing would be the following. Okay, uh, so decision tree random forest again. Remember, they are looking at local features, right? They are not looking at neighborhoods. But the simplest way you can do it is by feature selection. Okay, so are you familiar with local spatial autocorrelation measure like local Moran's I or Lisa measures? Are you somewhat familiar? It, yeah. If not, yeah, uh -huh. go ahead. Hmm. Yeah, I am familiar, but I'm not uh, very conversant. Okay, you know, so basically what you do is you you uh, add some new features. So each pixel, you know, would have its local property, right? You may have RGB and, you know, near infrared and all the bands for each pixel, right? But in addition, you add some new features, which is the neighborhood features. So you can say average redness in the neighborhood, right? Average greenness in the neighborhood or average near infrared in the neighborhood. And with variogram, suppose you know the size of the neighborhood, right? Say seven pixel or 11 pixel then you can use those and provide the neighborhood properties you know kind of to each pixel so this is the easiest way for you to capture autocorrelation okay you know okay. and and this one works with any classical method if you are using decision tree or you are using random forest or svm for each pixel you add some additional bands you can say which are the neighborhood bands and if you did that you know it's like a pre processing step then that to its chances are it will do better than not providing this information. So does that help? Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. So that's the easiest way to deal with autocorrelation. Uh, I mean, of course, purists will argue that, you know, it, this will take you more than 90% of the way. That's how I will put it. And that's the best way to start. And if it works for you, then you can try these spatial decision tree or spatial autoregression other models if you want. They have some advantages, but you have gotten 80-90% of the benefit already. Okay. All right, good. Any other questions at this point before we go to? So there's one more linear regression or logistic regression, which is more suitable for spatial data analysis. Ah, this is an interesting question. So remember the linear regression, logistic regression at the heart are the same thing. The only difference is the prediction variable. In linear regression, your prediction variable is continuous or numeric. In logistic regression, it's more categorical, right? A binary or something. But the IID assumption is in both, right? So what you know we were saying is, you know, if you are going to use linear regression or logistic regression, it's a fine place to start, but then you play the trick I just shared. Okay, if if this is what you want to use, you know, and you can put a logistic profit function here, that's okay. Then what I would suggest is in your explanatory variables, add some additional one, which is the neighborhood property. Okay, so expand your X vector by the neighborhood property. So suppose I was looking at water depth. So not only local water depth, you add another variable, which is the average water depth in the neighborhood. If I'm looking at distance to edge, not only look at local distance to edge, but also add average distance to edge for the neighborhood pixel, right? Uh, vegetation durability, not only have local, but also have the neighborhood one. And if you did that, then even this simple linear regression, whether it's logistic or regular linear regression, will probably do better than before, okay? So I would start there because, you know, since you're familiar with linear regression, you can do that and interpret it very well. And if it is helping you, if it is improving prediction accuracy and reducing residual error, you know, autocorrelation in the residual error, then <laughs> you may choose to try this. Okay. Uh, but that will take you more than halfway, you know, 80, 90% of the way. Okay. It's so another question. Will the autocorrelation help for discrimination between oil spills and lookalikes 
the dark patches on SAR imagery because they have same spectral signature. So this is a very interesting question. Um, so first thing I will ask is, you know, if you have tried uh, the regular methods like linear regression or Bayesian classifier on oil spills, and did you see the salt and pepper noise, right? So that's your question, because in case of this object detection, you know, so do you see this salt and pepper noise? So this was wetland, right? Green is wetland and red is not. And this is the ground truth. You notice that these are pretty contiguous chunks. But when I use a method which has IID assumption, then I see all these or, you know, little pixels, which is of one type surrounded by the other, right? So if you are doing your SAR imagery processing using, I do not know what you are using, CNN or something. So try to see, do you have salt and pepper noise? Okay, if you have salt and pepper noise, that's a signature that having some model of autocorrelation will reduce the salt and pepper noise as it did it here, right? Now, how you do it, there are many ways to do it. You can simply do a post-processing and a smoothing. So you can take a three by three or five by five tile and move it over and any pixel which is very different from all its neighbors, you can just align it to the neighbors, right? That's one way to do autocorrelation in a post-processing, okay? You can do it in pre-processing that you, you do put the neighborhood average properties as an additional feature to each pixel, okay? And you can also do it in the model as I was discussing, right? So I don't know if that helps. Okay. Okay. Or it actually in SAR images, uh, mm -hmm. generally we have the speckle noise, uh, but which has the same form as that of uh, the salt and paper noise. Ah, okay. Uh, yes. So, and how, how do you then deal with it? Do you do some smoothing or you do some low yes. band, you know, filter? How do you filtering? Do yes, filtering, filtering, Gaussian filter. I found to be more suitable for the but, SAR image. Good. And your Gaussian filter is nothing but spatial autocorrelation. What it right? Yeah. All you right. Yes. Yeah, so there are different vocabularies. Electrical engineers will call it Markov random field or Gaussian filter or wavelet, right? Yes. And spatial statisticians will call it spatial autocorrelation. Does that help? Okay. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Thank Sim you. Similar sir. ideas. Yeah. Thank and you, you are probably, you. are you using random Markov fields? Uh, no, sir. No. Okay. It, so it's it's not that different from, so Gaussian processes and random, you know, uh, mark, you know random Markov fields are very similar thing. Okay. Uh, huh. Yeah. Yeah, very, very similar ideas. Yeah, if you're coming from signal processing, then you are doing it <laughs> without re using a different vocabulary. Yeah. Thank you so Good. much. Thank you. Sure. All right. Any other questions on this point? Okay. So let me go to the last one. And again, you know, people are probably, you are aware of it and you do it, you know, maybe using different vocabulary. But the key thing is to be aware of cost of error. And in spatial applications, this is a concern because a lot of our applications are societal, right? You're looking at crops or water or disease and the errors are expensive. So because of that, spatial methods often have additional safeguard or guardrails to reduce the errors, okay? And I'll show you one example in hotspot detection. So going back to the London cholera story, remember this, right? Um, so one can ask, how do I find these dense areas, right? So if you, you know, do, so if I have disease locations all over a country and I want to know which areas have unusually high density, right? And this is something being done for SAR and, you know, for COVID-19 as well, then you will ask, you know, what are the methods I would use, right? And there are dense region detection methods like DB scan. But the key thing to remember is that they don't check, you know, they are vulnerable to noise. So in this space, there is another method called SAT scan, which came from National Cancer Institute of National Institute of Health. And what it does is to um, compute some statistical measures and I'm showing you here. So for London cholera, if you ran this software, it will give you this circle, and, but it will also give you two other values. There is a log likelihood ratio, which is telling you the density inside versus density outside. And in this case, you know, density inside is much higher than outside, but it's also giving you a p-value. And as you know, the p-value that, you know, the chance of such a dense cluster happening in a complete spatial random data is very low, less than one in 1000, right? So these are some guardrails that are applied to reduce the impact of noise and chance events, okay? Um, so let me, you know, I'll show you how that is done. So basically the idea is that you actually do a top-down thing. You, you enumerate candidates in the, in the case of uh, 
SAT scan, the candidates are circles, two point circles. So you pick pair of point, one is at center, one is at uh, circumference. And that circle is you know, first tested for likelihood ratio, saying the inside density, how much higher it is from outside. And we threshold it. And, um, and once it has passed the threshold, then we check for statistical significance. So what we do then is to generate a lot of complete spatial random data and see that, can I see a circle with that kind of a log likelihood ratio or not, right? So this is going to take out things of noise and so on, right? So this is typically what is done as a safeguard. Uh, there are other possible safeguards that should be applied when your uh, cost of false positive is high, right? Um, and first I will show you the extensions. So SAT, SAT scan is looking for circular one, but if your phenomena is linear like road accidents, then the circular tests are not going to be as effective. So in this case, that's all SAT scan finds. And we have extended it to linear concentration. So this is a linear hotspot detection. So instead of looking at density as count divided by area of the circle, we look at density as count divided by length of the route, right? And then that gives you better uh, things, right? We have also extended the shape from circle. We have gone to rings and arbitrary shape with statistical significance testing. So I'm just going to quickly show that. So here again, to tease the need to extend SAT scan. So we are showing you a Legionnaire disease in Manhattan. These brown dots are the disease. And uh, as you know, Legionnaire disease is water tower born. Um, and so, so here, you know, if you see this disease pattern, one asks which particular water tower to test first. So in the chat, you know, many of us are spatially aware. So which water tower should we test first? And these squares are the water tower. Would you put it in the chat? Yeah. Which water tower seems to be, you know, most central to the disease locations? Any guess? Yeah. Okay, Opera House, that's perfect because you see it's it's in the middle, others are on the edge. And that is the case that was you know found to be the issue in this case. But notice if you run SAT scan, it finds three dense areas around Opera House, but Opera House is not inside any of them. Uh, so we have developed other ones where you actually look for significant rings because of a particular theory in, in, in a serial crime. And uh, this theory basically says your source is inside the ring, right? And it puts it right around. So these are some extension. If you know DB scan, uh, which is used in data mining a lot, you notice if I throw noise, DB scan will still find clusters, these colored areas, right? Here, the test is the pattern with the background noise and DB scan still is finding things in the noise. So if you want arbitrary shape uh, hotspots, you know, we have added statistical significance testing to DB scan which cleans out the noise, right? So these are sort of different ways to put some safeguard, right? Um, and it's basically saying that, you know, there are good methods, DB scan K means they're all very spatial, but if your cost of false positive is high, then you should put additional safeguard like statistical significance testing and so on, right? And here, I just want to give you a sense of, you know, the spatial, you know, language a little bit more. So if you are putting dots in a space, then you know this is considered complete spatial random. This is when if you throw darts in a space, this is what they may look like. But even here, notice there are some dense areas which may look like cluster to DB scan, but they happen by chance. So if I test the statistical significance, those will be taken out, okay? This is where the data is naturally clustered and the dense areas here are not likely to happen by chance. The p-value would be really, really significant, okay? Now, here is another data set where you can tell these dots repel each other. You know, these are like planted forest and so on. And this is something classical data mining or classical statistics doesn't even think about. This is here where spatial autocorrelation is negative, you know. So in spatial, we do think a little bit differently. Instead of making the assumption, you know, everything is, you know, one size fit all and run, you know, like K means you can run on all, it will give you something. DB scan, you can run on, you know, all, it will give you clusters even here. But if you are spatially aware, you are going to, view it a little bit differently, right? So spatial cluster, we are going to say this is random, this is D cluster, and this is where we have some patterns. So with this, I'll try to wrap up, um, but I'll pause here one more minute. Is there any other question on these uh, safeguards and statistical significance testing for patterns? And as you know, statistical significance testing can be you know done for other patterns as well, you know, like co-location pattern, things like that. 
Even in classification, you look at R square, which is a similar idea. And by the way, spatial autoregression model does give you R square, um, you know, which, which will give you some statistical thing. So any questions? Let's pause a few, you know, 30 seconds here. Okay. All right, so let me wrap it up. You know, the last part I wanted to mention was visualization. And many of you have seen, uh, you know, Google Earth, right? Uh, where you can actually zoom in and zoom out. But I just wanted to ask you, has anyone, you know, how many of you have seen time-lapse, right? So people have taken satellite imagery for about 30 years and stitched them together to make a video. And, you know, if you, for example, I'll show you one from Calcutta, but this is one in, uh, for example, Dubai, right? So if you look at 30 years, you can see some of these major constructions happening, right? So let me see if I can launch one for Calcutta. So I know the Salt Lake area was redeveloped in last 30 years, right? So let's see if I can launch it. Looks like, ah, there it is. Okay. So are you, do you, do you able, are you able to see the urban sprawl as they say, or redevelopment of Salt Lake in this area? Yes. Sir. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. So, you know, this is worldwide. You can go in any area of the India or, or other places. And what they have done is to take the available Landsat imagery. So 1984 to 2020. So it's about 35 years now. And each year they took one snapshot and they stitched it together. So things that happened over 30 years, the big changes in land, you can see easily. Right. So these kinds of things are also happening. Uh, and that's another way to explore data. So this bottom one is showing you crime pattern in Amsterdam over 24 hours. And in climate change, you know, there are 3D visualizations as well. So, so that's also helpful in order to consume the data. It makes it easier for a broad audience who may or may not be statistically inclined, but they can enjoy the visualization. Okay. Okay. So let me try to wrap up. The main thing, you know, which probably you are in this course, you already know, you know, we, we think space geographic data is very important. And, uh, you know, whether it, this is trace of smartphone or vehicle or remote sensing satellite imagery or even social media, because many of them also now have location. Um, they are very important. They have a lot of values, right? Um, economic value as well as social value and many societal applications. Um, now, however, when you are trying to analyze it, they have some unique challenges and uh, it's good to not only use classical methods. If you're using classical methods, at least in feature selection, you should put spatial features like neighborhood properties and so on. Okay? In, um, but, you know, but if you, you know, spatial autocorrelation and modifiable aerial unit problem, heterogeneity and so on, those are special things for which new tools have been developed. And they may come in the flavor of, you know, geostatistics, or spatial data mining and so on. And these tools are widely available now. So if you can go beyond just feature selection, it's worth trying some of these tools as well. So this was a call, you know, community call for action saying all data scientists should know something about spatial. Right? So with this, I'll try to wrap up the talk. Uh, again, I said spatial data, all of you know, are important. Government of India has acknowledged it by opening up their own data sets. Uh, traditional data science tools are a beginning. If that's what you have access to, that's what we want to use, then at least do feature selection. Put some spatial features like distance to water or neighborhood you know, properties, and that will improve your results. Okay. But if you can, you know, if you have luxury to go beyond that, try some of the new methods that I discussed. Right? So with this, um, I'll you know list a few further resources. The first book. The spatial computing book is actually, you know, written for broad audience, MIT Press. And, you know, uh, that's certainly one place to start. And then if you like, you know, some of the material you want to go in more depth, then the third one, Transdisciplinary Foundation of Spatial Data Science gives you a little more formal view. And, and there are many other references here. So with this, let me stop and see if there are any questions or Dr. Chakravarti, if you have any closing uh, things. Yes. Uh, see, you can ask questions if you have. We already had a few questions in between. Okay. So, uh, 
So anyone can ask uh, this part on visualization. Okay, and it's uh, very long, two hours and late in India. So. No, 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 uh, not at all. It was a wonderful session, actually. Very, very informative. Very interesting, in fact. Uh, we, would have, we would have liked to hear you more. Okay. Uh, it's 8.30, not very late. Okay. Yes, uh, this lecture was very illuminating. And uh, actually, very uh, timely, I think, actually, uh, we together, we uh, actually I work in the Department of Science and Technology, Biotechnology, Government of West Bengal. Great. And we along with Macau, we are okay. actually conducting one uh, MTech in Geoinformatics course. There right. actually uh, we are trying to introduce this kind of thing, uh, this uh, data science, uh, big data analytics, cloud computing, in the particularly for the uh, in the field of uh, geospatial data. Okay. So that way, your uh, lecture was very uh, illuminating. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. As, as you know, DST has had you know activities going back 10, 20 years. So there, you know, um, about two thousand nine, they had. Um, organized the IUS STF workshop also, and they had funded a center in IIT Bombay to train more people in computer science to do GIS kind of work. And um, so this is wonderful to have this engagement. Um, and it's really good to hear that you already have a master's program in, in geoinformatics. So I hope these programs will grow and uh, there will be more interest. And I had one question, if, if any of you would like to comment, will be good. So you saw the recent Government of India announcement, right? They have opened up some of their geospatial data, at least for domestic companies. So I just wanted to get your reaction on what do you see, um, you know, the ramification or what are the you know, activities you are seeing in that space? Actually, uh... Government of India uh, long back started an, one initiative of spatial data infrastructure. But it yes. was more of a proof of concept type of uh, uh, project. Actually, uh, it was it, actually this hardware, software uh, installation of uh, this thing, creation of geo portal that took place in many states. But ultimately, uh, the data actually. Uh, people have a feeling that we will not share data. This, uh, for that purpose, uh, this data sharing didn't uh, took place. Actually, so with the advent of say, Google Earth Engine, now data is available for uh, for any any particular point and uh, say at any point of time. So now the concept is changing and government of India is also trying to uh, make avail available this kind of data sets. The Survey of India data sets, uh, open, open series maps, these are uh, available uh, on the web. So uh, yeah, government is trying. Let us see how it, uh, the impact, how, how will the impact. Great, great. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderfully, I hope some of your students and you know, and these courses would encourage uh, more usage and exploitation because India has one of the you know some of the best satellites and the data sets. So, yeah. in, in fact, some satellite. cases even here people but, go to Indian satellites. <laughs> go to this. In fact, even ISRO has uh, made uh, some sensor data free, okay. like some multispectral sensors, uh, and they are also free for use. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yes. Yes. And uh, whenever we need data, we normally, uh, we usually download it from the USGS. Ah, so, okay. okay. Hyperion data or Landsat data. So we normally, using the Earth Explorer, we download it and then we use it. Okay. Na the NASA Earth Exchange, that one? Yes. yes. Okay, wonderful. wonderful. No, this was really helpful. And um, okay, there's one question, which type data to use in SpaceX technology? Pramod is asking. 
Uh, so, so SpaceX technology, are you thinking about these, uh, the, the space exploration, the new the rockets that are going up? Is that what you're thinking about? Pramod, do you want to clarify the question a little bit? Sir, SpaceX technology in rocket. In the rocket, yeah. Yes, sir. So, so you know that see, SpaceX is more about uh, right taking the rocket to the space, right, and coming back. Uh, so they may have more to do with navigation. How do you make sure your rocket goes to your destination correctly and coming back, right? Uh, but usually what, you know, the, the link to what we discussed is the following. With SpaceX rockets, you can carry nanosatellites and actually you can put them in space, right? And these nanosatellites may be used for communication or they may be used for Earth imagery. So, so if you put those nanosatellites, you can collect this kind of a data, right? The SpaceX in its own, you know, part would be, you know, a lot of weather data they will use to make sure that the day of the launch, right, there are no weather interference. Uh, right now, I haven't seen them go to a specific destination except for the landing part, right? And there again, they have to make sure they land their rockets and so on at the appropriate place, which will be very much like, you know, if you will, will be your navigation software. If you use Google Maps, in some sense, a 3D version of that, right? So plotting the trajectory of these rockets, you know, taking into account gravitation and other physics, right? And then making sure it comes back. So the data sets they would use would be more navigation related, right? Um, trying to locate the shape, you know, with respect to the earth and trying to move it around so that it goes to the destination. It will be of that nature, right? And of course, weather can have a lot of interference. So during the day of landing and day of launch, they want to make sure the weather is cooperative, right? I don't know if that's what you were thinking or if there are other people in the audience who have worked with ISRO rocket launch, they might share what other data sets they use. I mean, you could also argue that you want to locate these rocket launches in areas which does not endanger the public, right? And so if you want to do site selection, that may another important thing, right? So you want to keep these uh, rocket launch and landing sites away from population and away from other things like fire hazards, you know, things of that kind. So you could bring in some of those layers as well, if you like. But those would be sort of, you know, the beginning, the citing the place. So Pramod, I don't know if this helps you or you had something else. Thank you, sir. Okay. Good. All right. So I'll give control back to Dr. Chakravarti if you want to make any closing things. Yes. Yes, on behalf of everyone, on behalf of the university and all the participants, I would like to thank you, sir, for this wonderful lecture. Um, I'm sure that it has been a wonderful learning experience for all, uh, for all, the, all those who are working in the field of spatial data science. Many of them had requested me, in fact. So I think they have got, learned a lot from this uh, two-hour session. Uh, we really thank you uh, for being with us and uh, we would like to invite you for more sessions of this sort. So uh, we will be keeping in touch with you so that uh, we can, uh, we, we'll be able to listen to you more uh, in the area of spatial data science. Great. So thank you so, so much, Dr. Chakravarti and everyone. I learned as much with the question answer and the interactions. I really appreciate it. For the participants, uh, there is one announcement that I would like to make. Uh, tomorrow, the 9.30 session uh, will take place at 3, 3 p.m. because of some emergency uh, uh, of the speaker. Uh, and the expert has, to go and has an emergency, so he will not be able to take the morning session. So uh, we will uh, start at 11.45 with session two. And um, the first session will be conducted at three o'clock. So from three to five, we'll be having the session. And after that, um, we will be having uh, the online test that I was uh, talking about, followed by valedictory. So, uh, so if, if there is any other question uh, regarding the FDP, you may ask. Uh, 
the tests the online test will be uh, mcq based uh, 